I was realizing this morning I've not pointed out and given thanks to uh, my brothers and my sister here who are providing ASL, uh, American Sign Language, uh, for our services. A couple weeks ago, or several weeks ago, I was approached and said, hey, would, would you be okay with more people hearing the gospel? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we can do that. And so, um, you know, Devin and, and Russell and Deb here have been uh, stepped in and, and have been offering that service. It's been an awesome thing. Deb's amazingly gifted. Uh, she's uh, a real blessing on our church for so many ways. Is it weird saying good things about yourself doing that? Okay, okay. If you have kids here, or even if yourself, you're thinking, man, that's, that's really cool. Put them in a place where they can watch during worship. I've actually tried teaching just by watching YouTube videos. My kids, some, uh, some Bible songs that we sing together every night uh, using sign language just to try to help them get engaged. And they really do get engaged so much more. It'd be a cool thing for your kids to grow up and be able to share the gospel with more people by learning new languages. So thank you very much, you guys, for what you offer down there. It's wonderful. This morning, we get to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, go back to where we have been for a few weeks. We're hearing an author tell a whole group of Hebrew Christians that they need to remain faithful. And in order to encourage them to persevere in faith, he gives them a list of names, famous people that they would know from their nation who had demonstrated great faith in God. And he's saying, be like these people. He gives them the list. And, and the list is, is people that you would know if you had read through the Old Testament. Kind of characters that would be talked about uh, in Sunday school or for these Jewish kids, Saturday school <laughs> for them on Sabbath day. The, the, the kind of characters that they would have bed sheets pointing at them as heroes or drawings on the walls of a nursery or a Sunday school classroom. A couple weeks ago, we saw Noah and his faithfulness and the fact that he was faithful in his building of an ark. That's how he demonstrated his faithfulness. We saw Abraham. He was first faithful for just obeying God and going to a new land that he'd never been before to get a new inheritance, leaving behind that of his father and going to his new heavenly father. Later, that same Abraham would demonstrate his faith by offering his son as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Now, if you remember the story, we covered this last week, God intervened, rescued his son from dying, and provided a substitute sacrifice in his place. So that Abraham's son Isaac did not die that day, but was given back to his father. So we can ask ourselves, as we read through a list like this, what does a man or a woman of faith look like in our day? I want you to ask yourself that question for a moment, and maybe do that by, by asking, who's a person that I know that I consider a faithful person? man or woman of God? Who would come to your mind if I asked that of you? Who's who's the image? And I'm asked this, what is it about that man or woman in your life that makes you think faithful? What have they done or how have they talked or lived? What What have they not done? What have they abstained from doing because of faith in God? This text that we're going to cover today is just a couple of verses. We're actually just going to cover three verses in our chapter today. Verses 20, 21, and 22. And in these three verses, we're going to be introduced to three more characters, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, Isaac's already been introduced, but we're going to see him be more the focus of this this, uh, portion here. But one verse given to each of these three guys, all of their stories can be found back in the book of Genesis. In fact, these three men comprise half of the book of Genesis, basically. And so today, we're going to cover half the book of Genesis, um, short order. So I'm going to kind of be hopping around a little bit. Hopefully, you can follow along. I'm going to put slides up on the screen and try to help you follow the flow of the text, because we're going to go to Hebrews, back to a Genesis account, Hebrews, back to another one, Hebrews, back to another. So so I'm going to try to help you follow along. And here's how we're going to start. I'm going to read verses 20 through 22, just start start out that way, pray, and then we're going to go back each verse, each each man at a time. So if you you want to follow along, you can. I'm going to put slides up here in a moment. But first, let's begin by reading verses 20 through 22 in Hebrews 11. By faith, 
Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. That's our text for this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we read through just these three quick quips about these men of God of old, I pray that we would be able to internalize all that was meant for this Hebrew audience and all that we are to take today. Father, let these three men and their lives and their faith be an encouragement to us, just as I think that's what this is here for. Uh, So Lord, let us receive that as a good gift that we may be as they were. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Going back to that passage in Hebrews, starting in verse 20 again. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. This Isaac, as I said earlier, was already introduced to us last week when Abraham, Isaac's father, went to offer Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Isaac was rescued from that moment by a uh, a voice of God telling Abraham, don't kill your son, Kill this ram instead. He provided a a substitute offering. It was a beautiful gospel picture for us. It was a reminder that we deserve death, but we've had the perfect lamb, Jesus, been offered in our place as a sacrifice. But this is the same Isaac who was the son of promise, the first child born under the covenant sign of circumcision in the Old Testament. He was born supernaturally because his mother was not only old, but she was barren. She was born, he was born due to God's miraculous work. Isaac, after the story that we saw where he was offered up as a sacrifice and God rescues him out of that moment, uh, right after that moment, he goes on growing up to, to marry Rebecca. Rebecca was of his father's family line, and so... It's an interesting story about how he meets Rebecca from his father's tribe. But Rebecca, his new wife, turns out to be barren, just like Sarah was. I want to show you what happens after her barrenness is realized, even though Isaac is supposed to be the one who will give birth to many, many down the line, descendants and a giant nation of God-honoring people. That was the idea, people through whom the world would be blessed. But all of a sudden, we hit another snag, yet another situation, similar as previously. Barren woman, no no baby's coming. So I'm going to go back to Genesis 25. I want to show you what happens back at that point. Genesis 25, 21 says this, and Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Simple, short Point here. The drama here is much more condensed than it was in the story of Abraham and Sarah. But Rebecca conceives supernaturally just as her mother in law before her. Apart from God's miraculous work, she would not have had children. And the promise God made to Abraham would have been broken. It was a necessary miracle because without that, the promise would not have been fulfilled. Now, just because it's hard to not say this. What I get from a verse like this is just this incredible encouragement for me as a, as a husband. Men, pray for your wives. Pray for your wives. Isaac does a lot of foolish stuff, embarrassing stuff, the kind of stuff that goes, really, that had to make it into the Bible? But he prays for his wife here. So one might ask, though, well, what if he didn't pray? Because God is prompted to do this miracle by the prayer. So what if he didn't pray? What if instead of going to God, he got angry? For crying out loud. Not only did this happen one generation before with me, God, but now you're going you're gonna to give me this woman who's, who's barren or you're, you're not going to make it so she just conceives naturally? What's the matter? What, why would you do that? But instead, he prays. What would have happened if he didn't? Well, not to dodge the question, But we don't have to worry about what if. Because when God makes a promise, you can rest assured that he will fulfill it. 
Nevertheless, it is a helpful reminder that God promises to accomplish his plans through human actors. It's a good reminder. God's going to do something, but he's going to do it through people. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So whether you see this story as a testimony of God's sovereignty or of his omniscience, him him knowing what will happen, or maybe both, His plans will not be thwarted by us. That's the idea. And here the focus of the story in Genesis shifts from Isaac and Rebekah to their children. So up to this point, we get a bunch about Isaac, how he meets Rebekah, what goes down with their relationship, and then, and then the kids. Let's continue on with this story in Genesis. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Typically, in our day, if somebody wants to know if they're having twins, they go get an ultrasound. Well, she just goes to God. Why is there something inside? Because there's two babies in there, and this is what's going to happen with them. She finds out she's pregnant with twins, and he even tells her something about the future of her children. And this is what he tells her. He tells her two things, really. Number one, they will both live to bear successors that will turn into nations of people. So they're going to be two nations, not one. That's one thing. And the second is this, that the nation of the younger will be stronger and more dominant than that of the older. That's what she's told about these two in her womb. Story goes on. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So this is what happens. The twins are born and they are named. And those names will have significance for years to come. We see some significance in the birth story, but we know by what's going to happen that the names actually have significance much further beyond something that happened in the moment of their birth. Now, you may have noticed when we read that passage in Hebrews, when we we did the verse for this story, uh, verse 20 in Hebrews 11, you might have noticed that the author of Hebrews names Jacob first even though Esau is the firstborn son. So he says Jacob and Esau instead of Esau and Jacob. It may not seem like that big of a deal, but if you are familiar with the story of these brothers, then you know that this is, in fact, quite significant. So let's just continue reading through this chapter in Genesis just to see what takes place. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. I've always kind of taken that a little bit as Esau being the manly man and Jacob being the mama's boy. And it's probably something like that. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom is red, like Esau, derived from the same word. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. See, you see the story? Esau's out hunting. He comes in, he's hungry. Jacob's sitting there with some stew. Esau's so hungry for it that he's willing to sell his birthright. They agree on the terms. And the birthright is traded. But the final comment in this verse is the point of it. 
Thus Esau despised his birthright. He despised his birthright. He cared more about a meal, lentils. I thought he was a manly man, but lentils. Than his birthright. That's the point of this. By this, we see that this was not just some simple, fleeting, albeit foolish exchange between two brothers over dinner. This was an incredibly consequential moment in history that would have ramifications extending into eternity. Why is it that Jesus came to the line of Jacob? Because of this event. In fact, Esau would go on to be another nation, one of the most uh, well-known, probably the most well-known Edomite in the, the history of the Bible is Herod. Herod was from Idumea. He was from the line of Edom. He was from the line of Esau, the one who sought to kill Jesus at his birth and killed the helpless boys of Bethlehem instead. This is perhaps the most poignant story in the Bible regarding instant gratification, isn't it? He squandered his inheritance in a moment. Teach your kids this story. Instant gratification is folly. This this same Esau would be hungry hours later, but he was willing to give up generations of blessing for a meal. In fact, Hebrews, and the author of Hebrews, will revisit Esau one more time in, in, our, in his, whole, uh, his, his whole letter. In Hebrews 12, he'll make mention of Esau one more time. And this is what he says about Esau in Hebrews 12, verses 16 through 17. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. We'll spend more time on that when we get there. But he's being used as a byword, as a warning, a point to that fool. Don't be like Esau. It's on the basis of this interaction that Jacob will go on to secure his acquiring of the birthright at the end of his father's life. A few chapters later than this in Genesis, we're going to see what happens as a result of this. And I'll just kind of quickly tell you the highlights of it. In that story, Rebecca and Jacob, uh, Jacob's mother and himself, they conspire to intercept Isaac's blessing for Esau at the end of his life. And their plan works. They pull it off. So Esau goes out to get some food, to to hunt some game and bring it back for his dying father to get the blessing. And and, uh, uh, Jacob is given some clothes by his mother and said, go in there and pretend to be Esau and steal the blessing. So if you're thinking real quick, well, he bought it fair and square. Shouldn't it be Jacob's now? Well, even if that were the case, Jacob is not held up as a picture of virtue because in the account, Jacob bold-faced lies to his dying father three times. He steps into the tent, and Isaac says, who's that? I am Esau, your son. He lies right through his teeth. And Isaac, Isaac goes, you, you sound like Jacob. His eyesight was failing because he was so old, so he couldn't see him. He says, you sound like Jacob. I'm not Jacob, I'm Esau. Lied again. His father even felt his arms and his mother had cunningly put some cloak on on him to cover up his arms and the back of his neck with with hair, uh, goat skin, so it felt more like the hairy arms of his hairy brother Esau. Literally, literally went that far. He smells, you smell like him, you feel like him, you sound like him. No, I am your son Esau. He lies a third time. But in that story is when Isaac gives the blessing to Jacob. And that's what's going on in Hebrews 11. The blessing is given to Jacob. So let's look at that blessing that shows up in Hebrews, or Genesis 27. This is the words given by Isaac to Jacob. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. You may have noticed that this blessing essentially is a retelling of God's promise 
to Abraham, then to Isaac, and now going down to Isaac's son, Jacob. After this story, God will rename Jacob Israel. And that Israel will go on to bear 12 sons. They'll become the 12 tribes of Israel. And at the end of Jacob's life, he too will offer a blessing to his children as his father had before him. And that brings us back to Hebrews. Let's go back to the next verse in Hebrews. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. A few notes about this. First, Jacob, I said before, is renamed Israel, so we'll see that retold later uh, back in the Genesis account. He'll be called Israel. He has 12 sons, but here he's specifically called out for blessing one of his sons, Joseph. And he's also said that to bow in worship over the head of his staff. If you're just kind of hunting this down in commentaries, that is an exact line from the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, because the word staff and bed uh, are derived from the same word. They look almost identical in Hebrew. So when the writers wrote this, they are retelling it just as it was written in Greek. In his final moments, as he's preparing to die, kind of on his deathbed, so to speak, as an act of worship, he blesses the sons of Joseph. Now, kids, listen up for a second. Do you remember who Joseph was in the Bible? Joseph was that famous character. We've made lots of, we've had movies about him, songs about him. There was a musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, that was made uh, not, not too long ago. And uh, it retold the story of this man's life because it's one of the most fantastic stories in the Bible. It's 10 chapters of Genesis, and I'm just going to kind of revisit the highlights right now. Joseph was one of the youngest sons of Jacob. Not, Not the youngest, but one of the youngest. And he had been given dreams, visions by God, where he saw himself, essentially, uh, being bowed down to by his brothers and even his mother and his father. And he went and he told his brothers and his parents about it, and they got prideful and jealous. And the the, the brothers uh, captured him. They ripped off his cloak. They put blood on it. They gave it to his father, said, he's dead. Sorry, dad. And they sold him in slavery to Egypt, hundreds of miles away from his home. So Joseph grows up in Egypt as a slave. And Potiphar, uh, who, who he's, he's the, the master of Joseph, Potiphar's wife has eyes for Joseph. She goes after him, and because he wants to remain pure and true, he runs from her sexual idolatry. And instead of being rewarded for that, he's put in jail. He spends the next several years of his life in prison. God uses him there, and he works his way up the ranks in prison until finally uh, he is brought out of the prison to stand before the king of the land, Pharaoh, to interpret Pharaoh's dream that's been torturing his soul. So Joseph tells of this dream. God gives him the uh, supernatural ability to know what the dream means, which therefore sets Joseph up to be the second highest officer in all of Egypt, the second most powerful man in the land. And God uses him to rescue the entire region from starvation. Awesome story. Read the story with your family. Walk through all the details of it. But Joseph not only saves the region by preparing for this period of time where there'd be uh, starvation and, and, and famine, but he even saves his whole family, who at this point thinks that he's dead. When they finally move down to Egypt to be near him, he reveals that he is, in fact, the lost son. And this is a beautiful uh, family uh, revival moment. But Jacob passes his inheritance down to his sons when he's dying. And in Hebrews 11, Joseph is specifically called out because Jacob does not only give inheritance to his 12 sons, but he also gives his inheritance to Joseph's sons, his grandsons. And that is what is so significant. He passes his inheritance down to them, treating them as equals with his own sons. This was as great an honor as Joseph could have hoped to receive. Not only does he receive the greatest inheritance blessing from his father, but he receives a double blessing passed to his sons as well. I want to show you what's being talked about here in in verse 21 by jumping to that portion of Genesis, uh, chapter 48. You can look at verses 15 and 16. 
This is when uh, Israel, or Jacob, is blessing Joseph and his sons. And he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked, the God who has been my shepherd all of my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them, let my name be carried on. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And there's an interesting line about him crossing his hands to give a greater blessing to Joseph's younger son, like he was a younger son, Jacob was. But again here, Jacob repeats the promise that God made to Abraham. The Hebrew author now jumps from the end of the life of Isaac to the end of the life of Jacob. Now he's going to jump to the end of the life of Joseph. Let's look at the Hebrews text one more time. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. At the end of his life, Joseph's family was no longer in their God-granted land of inheritance, but in Egypt. They were sojourners there, strangers, outsiders. But Joseph believed that God would bring them back again someday. He believed in an exodus the time of them leaving Egypt and coming back. And he actually tells them to bring his body with them. You dig me up, you take me out of, out of uh, the tomb, and you bring my body, and you lay it with my fathers up there in the promised land. Now, this was not just Joseph's optimism. Maybe, maybe someday you'll move back there. He knew that God had foretold that this would happen. and That's what's so significant here. I'm going to show you that one more jump back to Genesis in another place. At the end of Joseph's life, this is what he says as he's passing his inheritance down to his sons. In Genesis 50, 24 and 25. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. Literally, take my body and bury it there instead of here. Don't leave me down in Egypt, but put me where my fathers have been buried. God had already told this exact thing to Abraham, that there would be a period of time that the people of God would be in Egypt as sojourners. Let me show you, show you this. I'm just going to read this part to you. Long before Joseph's time, this is what God said to Abram, Abraham. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. And he tells them that there will be an exodus. They will come out of that land and back to Israel. This same thing is repeated by Jacob at the time he gave his blessings to Joseph's sons. Genesis 48 tells us, Israel said to Joseph, behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and bring you again to the land of your fathers. So Joseph believed that. In fact, he believed it enough that this command is evidence of that. By him saying, surely, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. I know God has said you will all come back to the land of inheritance. You will come back to the promised land. And when you do, because it will happen, God promised it. When it happens, bring me up too. There's a statement of trust in God. So those three verses bring up those three men, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And they are being commended for their faith. They are supposed to be an encouragement to us, to the Hebrew audience, and to us today. So first, What was their faith in? That God would fulfill his promise to grow their family line into a mighty nation and to bless all nations of the earth through their offspring. This was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. He was the one. He was the offspring that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through. They didn't know how it would work out, but they knew that God would, in fact, do exactly as he had promised. And they believed that. How do we know? How do we know that Isaac, that Jacob, 
that Joseph, how do we know that those men had this faith? In fact, how is it that these men demonstrated their faith in God's promise? We don't just go, I suspect they believed. The author knows that they had faith, and he shows them by telling of them, telling three stories of their lives. How is it that they demonstrated their faith in God's promise? This is how we're going to finish our time this morning. I'm going to give you two answers to that question. How did these men demonstrate their faithfulness? First, first and foremost, they persevered in their faith until death. Their faith endured. These were imperfect men. They had lapses of faith, certainly, embarrassing ones that were recorded in the Bible for us to look at and go, man, they did that. But they never let their faith go. And this is why each of these patriarchs are memorialized here in the final moments of their lives. Because at the very end, they remained faithful. In their final words to their children, they were demonstrating that they believed, that they had not lost faith, that God would do what he said he was going to do. Each of them had, had material cause to doubt it, didn't they? I mean, Joseph, is, he, he knows the promises, they're going to end up back there, but wait, I'm dying down here, we're, we're all down here, the whole family's here, no one's even back up there anymore. I, we're all in Egypt, no one's up in the, the land of promise. God, it doesn't seem like your promise is going to come true. But he believed, as his fathers did before him. And that is the point of this passage. It's why this letter, Hebrews, exists. It's why we have it. Because all the way up until their death, they believed. You and I are to be encouraged to have the same kind of enduring, persevering faith. That no matter what happens in life, we are to, in our lives, we are to keep on believing. We are to endure as Christians, even imperfectly. You might say, well, there's many times that I've faltered or I've done something foolish or I've not operated out of great faith. Of course, just like these guys. But hold fast. Jesus doesn't demand great faith in order for us to be persevering, but faith like that of a mustard seed. Even a small faith, a little faith held fast. This is what we need. We are to believe that this has been fulfilled, that Jesus died for our sins and has made us righteous before God by faith. We are to keep on believing that until the end. If you're not a believer today, And you're wondering, what is it these people believe? What are they supposed to keep on believing? We're supposed to believe that God has indeed done what he promised to these people that he would do. That he has given us his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life, to die for our sins, that by belief in him, we may have eternal life. Believe in the Lord. Repent of your sins and turn in faith to him. Without delay, this is your charge. And once that faith is yours, persevere. Keep it till the end. Don't let it go no matter what. And this is the primary point of the passage. But there is something else that is glaring at us from this text. And it's this. That just like Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, we are to pass on our faith to our children. I want you to consider this for a moment. The author here is picking great moments in Hebrew history that highlight the faith of Old Testament saints, right? That's what he's doing in Hebrews 11. It's not surprising that he would select these three men, these patriarchs. Well, they they should certainly make the cut, right? If you were to pick a list of people that we would look back to and say, look, look at these guys. God did great and wonderful things. They were faithful. The line continued through them. These guys would make the cut for sure. But what is surprising is what the author leaves out. What he's not commending them for. So in other words, if you were to recall moments of Isaac's life where he demonstrated faithfulness, what would you say? You could have brought up the fact that he let his father offer him as a burnt offering. That seems at least implied in the text. You could have talked about the fact that he prayed to God to open his wife's womb. God, do a miracle because you promised. How about Jacob? What moments of faith do we remember there? Perhaps how God gave him a dream and repeated the promise he'd given to Abraham and Jacob believed God and he built an altar to him. 
Or maybe how he worked for seven years for the love of his life, and then seven more when his uncle betrayed him. How his flocks grew in abundance, and he attributed that prosperity to God alone. God has given me all of these wonderful sheep and goats, all these servants and all this property. Maybe how he purged his household of false gods that had slowly kind of made their way into his home. He dumped them. No. How about Joseph? Uh, What would you say about him? If someone were were to ask you in an elevator, you have one minute, hey, I've heard about this guy in the Old Testament, this Joseph guy, Egypt. What's this Joseph guy? What's significant about him? What would you say? Maybe you would say something about him being sold sold into slavery by his brothers. Maybe about the fact that he trusted God in spite of that. Perhaps the fact that he would not dishonor God by sleeping with Potiphar's wife, but instead ran away without his cloak, which landed him in jail. And while in jail, he remained faithful to God. He didn't pout and whine, God, why? Why me? He stood as a man of God, and it shone and all the people around him knew it. And the, the, the set of the guards, like, they knew they didn't need to worry about anything. Joseph will manage everything in the prison. Jace, Joseph, you're in jail. You might as well take the keys because you can handle everything. Listen, he interprets dreams by God's power for the cupbearer and the baker, uh, those, those right-hand men to, to Pharaoh. They'll be the one, uh, one of them will be the one to eventually point him to, to Pharaoh later and say to Pharaoh, I remember this guy in prison. You should talk to him. He's a faithful man of his God. And he knows how to interpret dreams. Maybe you would tell people that story. You, ever, you guys ever seen that, that musical? Uh, Amazing Technical or Dreamcoat, Joseph? Do you know what story that doesn't include? The one mentioned in Hebrews. We know all about him saving the people from starvation, rescuing his entire family, the biblical lineage. None of that makes this story in Hebrews. None of that is being drawn up as what to commend Joseph for or Jacob for or Isaac for. None of it. None of those deeds are mentioned. Instead, he points to the final moments of their lives. That while persisting in their faith, they passed their expectant trust on to their children through the pronouncement of blessings. Why is that so commendable? We don't live in a day where that moment of blessing is considered so significant. In fact, how many people have died this last year without anyone being allowed in the hospital room to spend time with them? We have undermined that important moment of what will you say in the final moments you have with your children? What blessing would you want to pass on? What would you want them to know about you and your life? And what would you want them to imitate moving forward in theirs? Why is this so commendable? Because few things are more important in this life than what a father teaches his children. That is his legacy. More than the war stories, more than the heroic deeds of travel and turmoil, more than the way that he overcame adversity, none of that is worth a lick if the people of God fail to pass on their trust in God to their children. In fact, the gospel survives in culture by the passing down of truth to kids. In fact, if you look at any generation in history, if that generation of believers stops training up their kids, it's gone in the next one. And we know what failure looks like. It's happened before. The entire Old Testament records that for us. What does it look like when one generation does not follow in the footsteps of their fathers? The people of God were commanded two things after the events of the Exodus. They're given a a law. they're, They're told by God all these things are supposed to go do and accomplish. And this is what it says in Deuteronomy 4, 9 and 10. Follow along with me and look at this. God is speaking to his people. Only take care. And keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, 
How on the day that you stood before the Lord, your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph expected that their faith would continue in their kids. So Joseph, for example, does not say, take my bones with you, oh, I mean, as long as you still believe. Uh, you know, as long as you still want to follow that God and uh, as long as you still find that land appealing. He says, you will go back. God will do this. And he expects that that's what will happen. But somewhere along the line, the generations stopped, stopped doing this stopped expecting this of their kids. They instead gave their daughters to the Canaanites. They instead passed their inheritance land down to the unfaithful sons along with the faithful ones. I know that it's a common sentiment today and there's partial truth here, I get it. People say, well, they couldn't control the direction of their kids lives, could they? They couldn't control what would happen in the next generations. That's only partly true. That's only partly true. Can you imagine what would have happened if when the Canaanites, the the, the Philistines, the, the, the landowners there in the land that were not driven entirely out, when they brought their men to Israelite daughters and said, my, 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 my son wants to marry your daughter. Imagine if the Israelites were like, nope. Imagine when wicked sons turned from God and began worshiping Baal if the fathers disinherited them and said, you may not have my land. What would have happened in Israel? Exactly what God commanded. That the faith would have been passed. They would have rewarded trust in God. And it would not have fallen as it had. Do you not realize how significant this is? Seriously, this is what's being pointed to in Hebrews. These guys blessed their kids. That's what's so faithful about them. Be like that. All the way to the end of their lives. This wasn't just a, well, I trained them nursery school, now they're, they're out. No, it's to the end. Brothers and sisters, this persevering to the end is why we're, we're eager to point you to Christian authors who are dead. Dead Christian authors are the most trustworthy ones. You know why? Because they can't produce any new heresy. They've proven their life's done. They finished. They finished well. And you can go, thank you, Lord, for a life well lived. We should devour that good stuff. How is it that in one to two generations of our country, this place has turned into such an unrecognizable shamble? And you don't have to think our country has always been perfect to think that. We know our blights, our sin, our wickedness, and our blemishes. How is it that the worldly leaders of the institutions in our nation have succeeded in turning this country into what it has become so quickly? Answer, they went for the kids. That's how they did it. Have you ever watched a kids movie, a TV show with with your kids? And you're just watching the show and you're enjoying watching the little bear hunt down his yo-yo or whatever. Little songs and things are fun and kind of lighthearted and you're just enjoying it. And then all of a sudden, bam, agenda. You're like, well, why, why did they need the transgender guy to be the good guy? For the kids' show. Why do they make the dad a buffoon and sometimes the mom? Why do they need to insert this ridiculous agenda? You ever, you ever been there? Like, come on, guys. It's just a kid's movie. Can you just leave the agenda out of it? <laughs> That's the strategy. That's why it's in there. It's there for a reason. It's not an accident. That was the whole point. You get the kids, you win the game. God knows this, and it's why he commanded his people, whatever you do, you remain faithful, but that will be nothing if you don't pass that on to your children. Teach them and your children's children. That's a grandparent's verse. That should be our strategy, not the world's. 
Imagine what it would look like if for the next two generations, every God-loving, Christ-exalting, Bible-thumping Christian tripled our efforts in training up our children. What if we cut off every place that the world has influence over our kids and we rescued that back to Bible truth? What if we did that? I'll tell you, that's a basket that's worth all of our eggs. What if Isaac, here's the question. What if Isaac had persevered in his faith but never taught his son, Jacob, to honor the Lord? What if Jacob taught his 12 sons how to be great shepherds but didn't teach Joseph to pray to God for strength? What if Joseph saved the known world but didn't demand that his sons expect that God will fulfill his word? They wouldn't have made this list because they're being commended for passing that blessing to their kids. Brothers and sisters, your faith, like mine, is imperfect. Just like these guys, riddled with holes and faults and foibles and things that make us ashamed. But they did raise their kids to believe God's promise. And they persevered to the end. And they parented and shepherded to the end. And in the final moments of their lives, what they most wanted to pass to their kids was not keys to that car, don't forget that barrel of food you can have, and uh, oh, that, our, our rental property, we have, you, you, you can carry that on, or uh, the lake house, you get that. The promise of God. That's your legacy, kids. That's who we are. Man, we need to reclaim that idea. People merge community all together so much that they forget the family unit. And it is good and right for you to say to your kids, we're Sanfords. We follow the Lord. Remember who you are. I don't want to persevere in my faith for my kids to fall away. I want more than just perseverance for self. I want my perseverance to rub off on my kids. I want to be like Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Of course you can't have full control over what your kids are going to do. Of course, some of them are going to turn. But I want for you and for yours also generations of faithfulness. Over the next couple of weeks, Lord willing, I'm going to be taking a break from Hebrews and I'm going to be preaching on how we win the war. I think the Bible gives us tons of of clarity on what to do in days like this. We are not left to defeat. We are told exactly what to do in certain places and given clear principles in others. And that's my goal and hope in the next couple weeks to encourage you. But here's what we need to land with today. We must persevere as these saints of old and we must pass a persevering faith on to our children. Let's pray. Lord, you are good and kind to us. I am well aware that when we see and think of things like this, it almost seems it's so unfamiliar to the modern American Christian mind that it's obscure. Lord, help us to regain the demands of your word to raise up our children to love and honor you. Lord, we know, we know and fully acknowledge that even faithful parents who love you and and try to teach their kids right, sometimes the kids just turn anyway. We know that that happens, and it's heartbreaking. But Father, somehow the past couple of generations have come to expect that out of their children and then become surprised when they meet those expectations. Lord, I pray that you would help us to regain a biblical vision for generations of faithful believers. Help teach us how to honor your word's command to train up our kids in this way. Help us to be the kind of people that persevere to the end, and that perseverance includes passing that faith on to the next generation. Father, we pray that you would do this work because we know that victory is ours. This age will be won exactly as you have commanded that it would be. And I pray that you would bring us into that mindset of victory. We would not walk around despondent and defeated as though there is no way for us to pull out a win. You, Lord, have declared it from the beginning. Lord, help us like Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, who in the moment when we look around, it looks like we've lost. 
Father, help us to be so optimistic about your future plan for this world, for what you will do with your church in this broken world, that we move as victory-driven peoples. Father, we love you and ask that you would do this mighty work in our hearts through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.